When we spoke with uh, um, a number of you and others involved with planning, we asked a question of who could be a person to lay out a vision for Baltimore in the face of racism and where we need to go. And Congressman Cummings, the name came up over and over again. Congressman, forgive me if I don't have the facts exactly correctly, but I believe that when you were in elementary school, you were told that, uh, or your parents were, that uh, Elijah was a little bit slow and uh, needed to be in special education. We've been talking today about racism and disadvantage and how some particularly black males get slotted into certain ways. And it was somewhere a little further along that a student, that a teacher said, slow, you're extraordinary. And Elijah Cummings went on to be extraordinary. Or maybe because he had the opportunities, he was able to capitalize on his gifts. He went on to Baltimore City College, went on to Howard University where he graduated Phi Beta Kappa, not exactly the hallmark of someone slow, went on to the University of Maryland Law School, went on to the Maryland State Legislature, and in 1996 went on to be our representative from the 7th District where he has held that seat continuously since then. I can think of no one better to speak to us at this hour about racism and the future of Baltimore. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Elijah Cummings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Director Blum. I want to thank all of you who have gathered here today as we consider the death of Freddie Gray. I really didn't want to do this. I, because I get tired of talking. So many people talk, but I come from a neighborhood who, which we have so many people who say, we want to see what you're going to do. And we here, I am sure, are the converted. We are the ones who think we understand the problems. And we have a tremendous desire to do something about it, about them. And It's not easy to come up with the solutions, but I'm just going to try to give you some pieces of my thoughts. I, I, and I have so many thoughts about this because I live it every day. I see it every day. Um, when you think about racism with regard to health care, when you see racism regard to education, racism with regard to our criminal justice system. And I must tell you that I applaud, first of all, the you all, everybody who's gathered here, 
because there's so many other things that you could be doing. But you have come here because you want to see the world and make it a better place. Am I right? Come on now, don't, don't leave me out here by myself. You're the ones who understand that a hundred years ago, none, none of us were here. You're the ones who also understand that no matter how much yogurt and granola we eat, no, much, no matter how many exercises we do, a hundred years from now, none of us will be here. We get that. And you're the ones who are determined to make sure that while we are here, that we do everything in our power to help our fellow citizens on this planet live the very best life that they can. Now, that may sound like a normal thing. But sometimes I must tell you, Dr. Blum, that when I look at the Congress of the United States of America and I look at some of our government institutions and I look at some folk in our nation and in our world, it, is not seem, it does not seem to be normal to want what you want. Perfect example. Exhibit one, Flint, Flint, Michigan. I ask you, is it normal for government to take over, state government to take over, local government, and then be responsible for poisoning the water when thousands of children are drinking lead, and when the governor of that state says that it's okay to drink water that looks like this podium, is that normal? And is it normal for after somebody breaks something and messes it up, they don't turn around to try to fix it? As of yesterday at noon, the state of Michigan had not bought one single bottle of water. This thing's been going on a year and a half. And I've been, I've been struggling, Blum, with this whole concept of racism. Racism, you know what, I, 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 I never use that word. Can I tell you why? I'm going to give you a footnote. The reason why I don't use it is because people get it all emotional. No, they do. They get very defensive. I will never forget Joe Scarborough, who's a very good friend who I served in the Congress with, when the chairman of the Oversight Committee shut down my mic. Y'all remember that? He never did it again. But a day or so later, Joe said, Elijah, don't you think that was a racist kind of move? I said, Joe, you will never get me to say that that was a racist move. I said, because, I said, because if I said on national TV that that was a racist move, that would become the headline. And you would miss the message that I was trying to speak for 700,000 people, many of whom don't have a voice. You missed miss the message that we were trying to uh, 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 pass the Affordable Care Act, and we're trying to deal with police brutality and those issues. I don't want you to miss the message, so I'm not going to say that it was racist. Now, if you want to say it, that's you. 
reason why is because it becomes so explosive and pe uh, people, while they know that something may exist, they understand what it is, they smell it, they see it, they know that it cannot be anything but certain things, they don't want to deal with it. And so because they don't want to deal with it, then they flip it and say, you, 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 you're pulling the race card. So I don't even go there. What I do try to appeal to is our higher angels. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't, don't get it twisted. I'm not saying that racism doesn't exist. I'm saying that at 65, I have come to a point in my life where I want to be effective and efficient. I'm sorry, I don't have much time. I don't have much time. And the people, the people that I'm trying to help don't have much time. They're like Freddie Gray, just had, trying to have a nice day. Just trying to have a nice day. When I went to Freddie Gray's funeral, I'll never forget. Cameras from 41 countries. Freddie Gray, black young man, probably never was interviewed by anybody. But when he died, Belgium, England, France, showing up. And I asked one simple question. I said, I know you're here today, but the question is, did you see him when he lived? Did you see the little boy who was born into poverty? the one where you could take just one of those lines out of the black national anthem that says, felt in a time when hope unborn had died. Did you see the little boy who ingested lead because his parents had to move from house to house? Did you see him? Did you see the little Freddie Gray when he got to the second and third grade, and the teacher pulled out that used reader. You know, the one that had been passed down. You know the one I'm talking about. And asked him to read the simple words, see, spot, run. And he could not read the words, but could not understand why he could not read the words. Did you see him as he struggled? Did you see him when he got to the fourth grade and could not read? Did you see him then? Did you see him when he began to act out? Did you see him when he started doing little things that boys will do and then had his first encounter with the police? Did you see him then? Did you see him when he got the police record? Did you see him when he couldn't get a job because of that record? Did you see him and if you think about Freddie Gray, oh God, it just hit me. When you think about Freddie Gray, the three things that you all talk, are talking about here today, the criminal justice system, education, and health, all of them hit him in the gut. Freddie Gray, did you see him? And so I've come here with a simple message. I'm not going to be long. You know, I, I, I've, I've been here to Hopkins, and I, and don't, I love this, this school, I love the Institute. And I, I love researchers. It's just that research is one thing, applying the research to practical solutions for people every day is a whole nother thing. You know, you know, folk can write dissertations, then they have to defend the dissertation, and then they graduate. And I always wondered what happened to all them dissertations. <laughs> Hello.
lot of time. We only have a short time on this earth. We don't have long. I know some of our younger people are sitting there saying, I, I got plenty of time, Congressman. Talk to some of us over 60. We will tell you that it seems like it was just yesterday that we were 25. So, what can I tell you? How can we make things better? Well, I'd appreciate it if y'all would pull some of the dissertations off the shelf and instead of allowing them to collect dust, allow them to help people. But there's something else that we need to do. We need to talk to people like Dr. Jacqueline Fulton, who's sitting right over here, who's at Total Health Care. We need to talk to people like Jackie. I've known Jackie since we were in high school. And Jackie, you need to have Jackie testify as to what she sees every day. You need to have her talk about why it is that we could have an Affordable Care Act and how we could cut the minority uninsured rate by 50 percent and still not necessarily see all the results that we need to see or thought we would see so fast. You need to talk to her about what she sees every day, like the person who had the appointment that never got there because he didn't have transportation. You need to, if you could call up Dr. Elijah Saunders, who did some research years ago, and his research was about the idea that, 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 that there were people who were going to the doctor for high blood pressure, but the, high, the blood pressure wasn't coming down. You know what they discovered? They wasn't taking the medicine. Hello. You know why they weren't taking the medicine? Hello? No. The men weren't taking the medicine. I'm going to leave it right there. There you go. Somebody's over there for me. I guess what I'm trying to say is that so, so often we come up with these wonderful conferences and we talk all the time, and some of the solutions are very practical solutions. But we first got to understand who we're dealing with. And it does not make, I'm not here for one moment to come in and tell you that there's something wrong with poor people. I was poor as a little boy. Very poor. But there were people who understood what I was going through. And instead of looking down on me, they came to me and said, I want to work with you. Not tell you what to do, but want to work with you. And so we have to be looking for solutions that may not be found in the super research. And I'm tired. I'm tired of organizations that establish themselves just to be in business for themselves. Come on now, I know I'm stepping on some toes. Thank God this institute is not that kind of organization. But y'all know what I'm talking about. We need to stop being honest with ourselves. It's either we want to make a difference or we're not going to make a difference. There are organizations that spend a lot of money and, and they never leave anybody empowered. So it's, it got quiet in here. I told some... some, some some of y'all look confused. Let me break this down. <laughs> I told some grant makers the other day. They had some grant makers here from all over the country. I told them, I said, if I were you all, I said, I wish I could sit in your seats. I said, because there are certain things I would require of, of, when I give a grant to organizations that are supposed to be doing good by the Freddie Rays of the world. I said, number one, I would want to make sure 
that they are empowering people and not leaving people dependent. Number two, I would make sure that they are collaborating with others so that people can get wraparound services, so that they can be most effective and efficient in what they do. I said, number three, I would demand accountability. I would demand that there be some kind of way of measuring what it is that you're doing and then don't come back to me unless you can show me that you've made a difference. And, by the way, footnote, I would want to look at your payroll to see if you're just hiring people, your, your cousins and your friends, and then putting out this report at the end of the year talking about what you did. I know, I know, y'all didn't, didn't expect to hear that. But the reason why I'm saying these things is I'm tired. I'm tired of seeing people struggle. You know, unless somebody can show you the light sometimes, you will forever walk in the darkness. And I think a lot, Blum, about the program that we have. We have a youth program in Israel where we send kids to Israel for a, uh, a month. And we t pick them up as 10th graders. And these are basically inner city kids. And one of the interesting things that we do with them is we teach them a lot of basics. You know, etiquette, um, soft skills. We bring in ex uh, leaders to talk with them. Then they go off to Israel. We pick them up in the 10th grade. They go, Jackie, between the 11th and 12th grade to Israel. We pay all the expenses. Somebody asked me one time, they said, well, why, why you don't send them to Africa? I said, you give me some African money, I'll send them to Africa. <laughs> Amen. Anyway. <laughs> but you know what I noticed? Every single one of those children over the last 20 years have been successful. You know why? First of all, they were respected. They were respected. And, and keep in mind, children, and by the way, also adults, go where the applause is. They were respected and they were lifted up. Not only they were respected and lifted up, they were made to feel special. And then when they got to Israel and were around kids from all over around the world and, and realized how fortunate they were, they came back. We have a 99% graduation rate from college in four years. Hello. These are inner city, these are inner city children. These are inner city children, Blum. The other day I was, uh, oh, this has been, no oh, man, two years ago. I was uh, just, you know, you, on Saturday morning trying to clean up. And uh, I heard this, uh, heard this voice. And the voice said, I was watching CNN, I was, had CNN on. The voice said, yes, and this is Victor Blackwell, and, uh, it's so good to be with you. We are reporting on this uh, uh, parent suicide from uh, Atlanta. And I said, boy, Victor Blackwell, that name sounds very familiar. So I went and I, you know, I looked at the television and I kept looking. And I said, Victor, is that you? <laughs> Victor Blackwell was a young man who came to us about 15 years ago, maybe 12, 15 years ago. And I'll never forget, he came, and he was a real chubby fella, and he was stuttering. And he said, hey, hey, this is coming. I just want to be a disc jockey. He said, I wanted to be a disc jockey. And I will never forget him. And here was Victor from the inner city of Baltimore, from around, I say, around Franklin, somewhere around Saratoga Street, near downtown. Victor bringing down $850,000 a year, the anchor on CNN who had participated in the program. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to lift young people up. 
and we have to have high expectations of them. So often what happens is that we don't have high expectations of people and we don't have high expectations with regard even to their health care. I tell the story quite often is that they, well, in the Congress, they used to refer us to the, uh, the Army Hospital, Bethesda. And I, I have rarely told, talked about this. But Blum, after I visited that, that hospital for about maybe 10 times, something hit me. The doctor never touched me. Did y'all hear what I said? The, de the doctor never, ever touched me, ever. And I could not help but think about my father, my grandfather. My, my grandfather, my father had a, a, a memory. His memory was about his, his greatest memory, and he talked about it more than anything else that I could think of was that when his grandfather was a, a when, his, his, when his father was a little boy, I mean, when he was a little boy, his, his, his father fell sick in the pulpit. They took him home on a, in a wagon down in Manning, South Carolina. When they got home, they had to call the doctors, and two doctors came in, two white doctors came in. One was an old doctor, one was a young doctor. The, old, the young doctor said, Doc, we got to get this man to a hospital. He said, don't worry about it. He's, he's just a Negro. And my father's father died that night. And, you know, the question becomes, is it racism? Or is it indifference? Or is it both? And I guess what I'm trying to say to you is that we have got to move to a point, if we're going to be effective and efficient, Blum, I want us to deal with racism, if that's what it is, but I also want us to deal with indifference. In other words, indifference with regard to the children in Flint, indifference to uh, a, a congressman that you can't touch, indifference to a Freddie Gray, indifference. And how do you deal with that indifference? I am not sure that me calling you a racist is going to get it. I'm just be honest with you. I, I'm not sure that that's going to. I'm, I'm not sure that that's going to work. I believe that you may, maybe we need to have the discussions. Don't get me wrong. Don't don't get upset, Plum. But I'm trying to try. I'm trying to figure out how do I be effective and efficient. So everybody get all upset. Oh, he called me a racist. And don't forget what I said. When you go there, what happens is is that people get caught up in the word and never hear the message. So, solutions. We've got to do what Elijah Saunders did. If we're going to do, if we, if we see that we are trying to accomplish something, and if we've been doing, by the way, the same things over and over again, and we're not getting the results, we need to look somewhere else and say, okay, what is our, what, how do we get the results? We need to accept the fact that some of the solutions may very well be simple solutions. We need to take what we have, and that is the compassion and the passion that we have, and take it to another level and say, we want others to join us. Let me, can I tell you something about passion? Passion, when you have passion, you can get people to join you. Passion is contagious. Even, you ever see somebody that was excited about something and you can't understand why they're so excited about it, and then you say, well, I want to I eat what they eat, and I, I want to join what, whatever it is that's making them feel that way. And what I'm saying to you is you are the converted, so you, and you are the witnesses, and you understand the significance of, of what happens when people are indifferent, or you may, if y'all want to use racism, you can use that, and, and you know the impact that it has. And so what you all have to do is be about the business of coming up with those simple solutions, allowing your passion to show, and trying to get others to join you. And one of the things that I do believe is that we have to continuously create those types of situations where people 
diverse people come together to do things. There's something about diversity. I've said it many times. Diversity is not our problem. It is our promise. It really is. And there's something, isn't it interesting when you look at a, a city like Baltimore? You got African Americans and whites, mainly in Baltimore, and they pretty much, pretty much vote the same. You know why I think that is? Because when you interact with people and you see what they go through from day to day, you come to understand their situations a little bit better. And, and so therefore, you, you, you sort of gravitate to, to trying to be helpful. That's my belief. And so, I beg you, I would ask, but asking is too cheap. I beg you to continue to do what you're doing. I beg you to have the audacity to look for new solutions. And I beg you to understand something that's very important. People do things for one of two reasons. I've learned this over the years, 65 years of life. They do things for one of two reasons, or a combination of both. Either to avoid pain or gain pleasure. Think about it. And you all have come here, and you, you may not even know it. You come here for both. The reason why you're sitting here today is you get pleasure from helping other people. Hello? Am I right? But you also avoid trying to avoid pain because you know that Baltimore cannot continue down this path. It can only lead to pain. You know that. You know it. And so what we have to do is convince the rest of the world that there are good things that come out of the kinds of things that we're trying to do, trying to come up with those practical solutions. And, and I'm close. I'm finished. Just want to leave you with one thing. My mother-in-law, who I love dearly, passed away September 26. She had one of those very, those virulent forms of breast cancer. And uh, a lot of people don't get along with their mother-in-laws. She was one of my best friends. She's a wonderful woman. She was the head of the NACP, you know the type. Exercised every day, did the whole, I mean, just a wonderful lady. She, uh, she was uh, head of the little Democratic Party and on and on, was in church every day, deaconess, the whole bit. One of the most well-read women I've ever met. I mean, she, she would read seven or eight books a week. She did some reading. And she could talk to you about any subject. And she used to email me at 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning with articles that she thought I needed to read. And she was not short on her opinion with regard to politics. So here was this woman laying in a hospice. And she had lost half of her weight. And I'll never forget, we, when we were engaged in one of the most difficult uh, conversations I've ever been in. I've never been in a conversation like this, where we were discussing her funeral. Anybody ever been there? It is not a pleasant feeling. And she wanted to be a part of it. So we're discussing the, the funeral. Matter of fact, she called to me, and she said, the first rule is I do not want a funeral. She said, under no circumstances do I want a funeral. Here's this woman who had produced one Ph.D. and two, two, two doctors. Faithful wife, knew everybody. And of course, the children said, well, mother, why don't you want a funeral? She said, not only do I, don't, don't I want a funeral, I want you to get the cheapest casket that you can find. A box will do, wooden box. She said, I would 
they tell me cremation is cheap, but I don't like the idea of getting burnt up. <laughs> Say, put me in the box. Just put me in the box and lower me. And if you want to have something, have a memorial service. And they said, well, what, why, Mom? Why, why is that? And she had been a school teacher. She said, because I, want, I don't want you to spend a dime giving it to the mortician so that you all can drive to some funeral in a limousine when you got your own cars. I don't want you to be renting no hearse. If it, the only thing I want you to hearse to do is get me from the funeral home to the graveyard. Don't, rent, don't go through none of that. She said, because it is more important to me that I leave the few pennies that I have to the children in the church who are trying to be somebody, who are trying to go somewhere. Because I realize that education is the key to them rising up to be all that God meant for them to be. So why did I tell you that? Went to the, to the memorial service, did exactly what she said. And when we told the story, money came from everywhere. And then they are able to help all kinds of children, children she did not even know. What am I saying? As we come to this Freddie Gray moment, I want to make sure that we come up with solutions and address the problems so that we don't have to keep doing this over and over and over again. You know, when I see, when I think about 1968, the riots here, and I think about the solutions that were brought up, and I think about the Kerner Commission. See, when you get a little bit older and you start to look at your own history, this is stuff, this is stuff that happened while I was here. And you see things going over and over and over again. And in the process of each one of those reports and each one of those instances of police brutality and each one of those Prob major problems, what happens is that there are people who have fallen by the wayside. There are families who have been, which have been devastated. Cat Stevens had the song, he said, Oh, very young, what will you bring us this time? You all didn't know I knew about that, did you? <laughs> oh, very young, what will you bring us this time? You're only dancing on this earth for a short time. Oh, very young, what will you bring us this time? Then the question also is, our children are the living messengers we send to a future we will never see. The question is, how will we send them? Will we send them crippled? Will we send them unable to read? Will we send them, in, like Freddie Gray, filled with lead? How will we send them? And what I'm saying to you is life is short. And so if we are going to make a difference, we need to come up with solutions that hopefully bring an end to this stuff. Because there's so many people falling by the wayside. And so that's all I got to say. Thank you. So I think about indifference and racism, and indifference, I think, speaks a lot about the value that we place in other people. The things that we value, we are not indifferent to. The question becomes, will we value all of our citizens of this city?
or will we be indifferent to them? Will we choose to take care of others' children as they are our own? The Congressman's quote of Carl Sandburg is one of the most, for me, powerful, important, and true sentiments, and that is, our children are letters that we send to the, a future that we will never see. And that is our challenge, to send all of our children into the future that we will never see with the same hopes and aspirations and capacity that we have for our children and that we aspire for our children. For those who are able to remain we're going to have one final conversation around table one and two. We will have a, the health group, anyone interested in that conversation around tables 11, 12, 13, where we'll have uh, one final conversation around education and around tables 22, 23, 24, we will have uh, a final conversation on policing. But again, today is about saying what is the one thing we want to do differently for ourselves? What is the one thing we want to do differently for the institution in which we work? And what is the one thing, achievable, small, and realistic, that we want to achieve for Baltimore? We hope that this conversation and set of discussions have moved us slightly closer to that. Thank you very much.